Should we rock, scissors, paper it? Is that how you say it? Rock, scissors, paper? What do you say? Is that the order you say it in? I say rock, paper, scissors. Yeah, what did you say? Rock, scissors, paper. Who says rock, I say rock, scissors, paper. It's rock, paper, scissors. Wait, no. Yeah, it is. It's, it's rock, rock, paper, rock, scissors. Oh, rock, scissors, paper, paper. scissors, shoot. Anyang SAO, welcome to Afternoon of Delight, where Leah, Megan, and Amy, romance novelists and your K romance guides. So grab some deck bokey and listen to your new favorite unease. Hey, everybody. Hello. Hi there. So I have like a question to pose to you guys based on a debate. I My can't husband. Wait. I well, it's really not that exciting. <laughs> I it's am just so excited. My husband is appalled that I do this, and he he actually said, "Can you pull your listener?" Amazing. And ask Amy and Leah. It's it's so stupid and simple. So I and I've said my husband and I are just very different people. So we just approach everything differently. But I have my phone set up that every time I get an email, I get a notification. Like it, like a notification comes through, my phone buzzes every single time I get an email. Okay. And my husband thinks I am a monster. Like even spam emails, like everything. Well, I have Gmail. So no, the spam you or promotion, categorized. it's literally only the emails that come in my primary tab. Okay. But like sometimes they're like a store email. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? They're like, yeah. a, sure. But I get a notification and my phone buzzes every time. And okay. my husband says, I'm a monster. And I, his, he's like, I could never. He actually told me this is the things that we debate about. This is how exciting our lives are. <laughs> he's like, my life would be miserable if I set my phone up that way. So okay. I'm curious if you guys do it. And then I really do want to hear from listeners. Like, do you know every time you get an email? No. Okay. No, I, I am very anti-notification though. Like, okay, so I only have notifications set for stuff that I want to be current with, like timely. Like I don't even have notifications set for our Slack. Like I just I don't check. Either, I just check it um, because I know it's always going to be going. I don't have no. I don't have notif- I don't have notifications set for any social media for my email. No, the only thing I have notifications set for. I think are like Life 360, which is how I track my kids with the, um, you know, f- with the 5G that I got implanted in them. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to look right now. Like, what do I get? Notif- yeah, I mean, I get notifications on virtually nothing. I mean, I will say, I email is one of the. I don't get notifications for it. Like, I don't have notifications set up for my social media or anything mm-hmm. like that. But I. I like, I see I if know, I get new emails, about- like, I have the red, you know, I have the red circle with the number. I see if I get no, new so, but I get, okay. like, a banner notification, so my phone can be, like, off. Well, not off, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Whatever it is. You must get Sleeping. them every 17 seconds. I don't really, on- only because it's, like, only the primary emails that come through my Gmail, so maybe, like, that's, I mean, I get it frequently, but I, like, like to know. I'm very weird about my I email. don't think you're a monster, but I just don't, I do not. I am anti-notification, like, in general. Like, I just, I want to look at something when I need it. But I also have a job. Well, so do you, Megan. I have a job where I sit with a laptop open all day, and I can see everything I need in a moment's notice. So, I, yeah. I think there's a thing, too. I don't have a job where I'm working with all these people who are sending me emails. Like, I work, I have, like, you know what I mean? Like, that doesn't but I mean, happen. Like, yeah, I'm talking like personal email anyway. I'm just saying like, I, right. I can have my Gmail open all day long and I do, like even yeah. at my job. Yeah, I get notifications for texts and for tracking my kids and that's it. So Leah, do you, I feel like you probably have n- notifications coming to your phone all the time. So I don't really know. I definitely do not get emails. I definitely Let's talk get about like, la- Leah with all her wait, tabs no. open and yeah, something wait, 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 starts wait, wait. No, playing no, 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 and no. she doesn't know <laughs> yeah. why. I was going to say, if we want to talk about monsters, I've been waiting with delight to get my chance to go. Okay. So I'm looking right now and I have three different emails open. And so these are three of probably like the six email addresses I have. 
For okay. my personal email, I currently have 11,031 unread messages. Oh my God. And that's not, that's not including like the extras, which are like, I'm seeing like 27,990 promotional Why? emails. Why don't you just delete them? Why? Oh my God. It, yeah. I, <laughs> How do you even have room in your G drive? This is probably why your internet's so slow because you have no room in your Google drive. That's not why my internet's slow. It's like I'm talking to my I drive. Know. <laughs> uh, my work email at the university, I have, oh, goodness, let's see, 1,725 unread messages. And my writer email, I have 2,072. So I have 20 unread messages. Here okay. is my hot take on this. I is zero. I guess I just don't care. <laughs> <laughs> that Leah is way more of a monster than you are, Megan. Because at least you're oh clearing my. that inbox. Like I, 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 I brought this up. This came up with like my my home friends a couple weeks ago because one of my friends was showing me her email no- notifications on her phone, and it had like it was like twelve thousand. And I was laughing about it, and then I showed it to my boss at work because it came up in conversation. My boss mm-hmm. shows me her personal email has like twenty two thousand. And she's like a very organized, like detail oriented person, but like she does not clear her inbox. That to me Ever. drives me bananas. Like I cannot stand when my inbox takes two pages, when there has to be an arrow for me so to go to the I next I feel page. anxiety. I have emptied my work email before down to like maybe like 20 emails when I have had time, which is very rare. I find myself quite anxious to see my, my, like, if I open my inbox and I can, like, I only have a page, I'm like, ugh, I need to have, like, 90 pages. You need chaos. Here. You need pure chaos. <laughs> well, see, here's the deal. My inbox is not empty. Like, I have 7,000 emails in my yes, inbox. Yes, yes, But I don't like no. them unread. Like, my Ooh, email But what have- if it's stuff, but, like, okay, here's the thing is that, like, I get plenty of emails that I just see from the title. Like I'm so when I'm talking about all of these, of course I miss an important email now and again, but mostly I don't. I mostly just do quick scans throughout the day to be like, dee, 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 that one's important. The rest of these, I don't fucking care. I'm good. And then I just like let them just kind of like drift away. Well, I let them drift away, but I at least un I at least <laughs> mark them as as red. <laughs> nope. I delete, 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 delete. Uh I'm I, I delete know it- like all day long. I, I do I delete it. a lot. I do. That's why my work one is only at 1700 and not at like 95,000 is because I delete quite a bit. So we have vastly different <laughs> methods. <of laughs> email. I love that all of us are different. The, the, re- the reason this, well, it's come up a lot, but my husband wanted to do something on my daughter's phone and he's like, I don't know. I think he was changing some like uh, settings or whatever. And her phone is just going off with, like, notifications. She's, like, in little group chats with her friends and, like, you know, Snapchat. And it's just, like, going off and going off because my daughter's very social. And my husband's like, I hate this. I hate using her phone. This is miserable for me. And I'm like, well, you don't even know how to, like, like, my husband's, like, he is a software developer. Like, Mm -hmm. his literal job is to, like, build things out of code. He cannot use Instagram to like save his life. <laughs> he had to ask me at one point where to find the Instagram DMs because he wanted mm-hmm. to send. No, I sent him something and he's like, well, I don't know how to find it. Oh, and I'm like, oh, my God, that's so sweet and boomer. <laughs> he, he's when it comes to social media. He just doesn't boomer. care. He doesn't care because he doesn't care. Right. He has no idea. There's no. Yeah, I think he's if he needed, recently. if he wanted to care, he would know everything about it. Accurate. You you have him pegged. That is that is accurate. So okay, thank you for. Cl- I I, I want to hear from listeners though. I want to know if you get notifications for your email, if your phone is blowing up all day. Because my phone really isn't. I turn I don't, off. It doesn't on, I turn off my notifications as much as possible. As, well, it just depends on like what I'm doing in life. I've had them turned off for quite some time because I'm actively writing and I have like ADHD. And so if it's like I hear the ping or the thing, it's very easy for me to be like, well, clearly I don't want to write ever. (laughs) And so I'm going to like look and see whatever squirrel red balloon came my way. Do you, uh, oh my God, I just lost my train of thought. Like block myself from sites? No. Okay, because I definitely don't do that. Uh, I used to, but who's got time for that? I do. I put on, so uh, when I write, 
I put on, I have a program called Freedom. Mm. So it basically just turns off my Wi-Fi. I just need to look up shit too much, especially now that I'm writing like this historical, like I'm constantly like, yeah, wait, what see? the fuck is like the name for the thing? Or like, what would like a servant be wearing at a ball? Like, I'm just like constantly, I've got Google going like all the time. I get, so what I do, uh, it's different if I was writing historical, like that's completely different. If there is like, sometimes I like can't think of a word or I mm -hmm. can't think of like something. Usually it's just like a word I can't think of. I just write triple X. In yeah, my book. And I, I, but this I would and then have I have to go. But then I, I have to, you can yeah, go search, find. Yeah, I just search my document at the end, and I have like a million triple X's, and I have to figure out. Then I have to do like all this work to figure out whatever. But that I found though, if I do stop myself to look something up, I'm like I'm fucked. Like I'm never. I'm not gonna go. So well, you know, writing is all finding what works for you. But if I was writing historical, that'd be a totally different animal. That would be yeah, very like, hard. I still look up. stuff up for contemporary though too. Like I, I'm yeah. I mean, I mean, this I really is the most this is definitely this is more than i ever have and i'm only in like my like first pass like you know what i mean like i'm gonna have to do more but it's still just like i'm constantly like oh what would you like drink if you were at this thing like what are you gonna have is like your little like whatever right and you're looking up like probably like clothing names correct like correct yeah all that kind of stuff which petticoats whatever they're wearing at the time i don't know yeah, you know buxton so do you want to know Women did not wear underwear in 1812 under their we dresses. We talked about this. Yes, we, we did talk about this. I yeah, think. yeah, which is fascinating. Because we're about, I'm about to do a ball, but I'm also trying to do like, not make it too gross. Like, I'm not going to have like people like taking shits in the morning or anything. Like, that's enough. We don't need to like get into that. But like at the balls, like, you know, they have like little discreet retiring rooms. Because like, where do you go? Pe like, think about ladies on a night out. Like, you're going to the toilet. A I'm lot. going to the toilet all the so time. So they've got like little areas with screens kind of set up discreetly between behind pots with like servants and you're just peeing into like little chamber potties that they're emptying and then like you're having your gossip. You're just doing it like sitting with everyone, which is funny because my parents just were visiting me and then we'll get to the to the meat and potatoes of today's episode. But as right. we're talking about bathrooms, um, you know, my campus is fairly woke and my parents have really made like a, I'd say a very concerted effort to stay with the times they don't get everything right but they have like an overall desire that's beyond what i expected i grew up in a fairly conservative environment and i'd say they've done an unusual thing in getting more liberal as they've gotten older which is unusual anyway but they're still like you know they still get tripped up on things and sometimes i just like to fuck with people because i'm a monster so we were going to the dining hall and my dad was like i have to pee really bad and then my mom's like, I have to pee too. And then Poppy was with me and she's like, I have to pee too. <laughs> and so I was like, oh, great. And I was like, well, this is perfect because we can all just go pee together. And like, they kind of looked at me. I'm like, well, how we do it here at the University of California is we have kind of just like the bathroom experience is kind of just like toilets all around the wall. And then we all just go to our toilet and we kind of just and like, like look at each other and do it in community make eye contact and they're just like ha ha and i was like dead ass serious yeah and then my dad's like well i guess i don't have to go that bad i'm like no no it's fine it's fine people don't really stare like you just kind of have your privacy but it's just about like kind of like breaking down those barriers and so <laughs> did you send him into the bathroom like that I, yeah, we all went but what's beautiful is that the bathroom is a gender neutral bathroom and it says in big letters gender neutral but when you go in it's it's stalls and doors yes, obviously I would, but i was like here we are at the gender neutral bathroom where we're all gonna just be as one and my dad was just like what the fuck um like, but That's like amazing. the other thing is that they were being game they were like well okay i guess we'll try this new thing so god love them and then I was you like, you gotta go, you gotta go. Yeah, you gotta go. And I'm like, nobody really looks. Everyone's just doing their own thing. It's fine. It's just like, we've decided that putting up like barriers between ourselves really, it's all about flattening hierarchy. Like, I had like a whole oh my thing God. I went through. You went full California on that. Yeah. And they were just like, oh, I talked so much that I made them think it was true because I was yeah. just like throwing it out. And Poppy's like, okay. <laughs> Poppy's like, I'll poop in front of anybody. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I freaking love her. <laughs> don't care. Ah! So, oh, okay. All right. Well, speaking of, um, of what? Pooping? I don't know. <laughs> Pooping, monsters, email. I don't know. Yeah. Speaking of things. 
We even had to segue like in so, a long time. I'm yeah. so close. I'm we so haven't... close with this one. I can. I don't have the brain for it, but I can like. It's just dangling. It's somewhere in my subconscious. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Speaking of things that cause frustration, I mean, yeah, sure. It's not. It's not good. It's not good, but it's better than. No, it's accurate. It's, okay, we're back to a segment we haven't done this in like almost a year. It has. I know. I feel bad because we really should. We there are we characters have the ability. Who need this. And we ha- like I have a backlog, truly, of characters that need this. So, yeah, we need to be a little. It's just that it is. This is more prep work. These episodes are always more prep work for us to do. Uh, to do this. So maybe that's it. But yeah, we're back with um second another lead. second lead, SOS, where yep. we give you know our favorite and oftentimes shafted second leads um a second chance at happily ever after. By writing them their own stories. So before we get into our, so basically, yeah, we're each going to go through, say, kind of explain the the genesis of our story and give kind of like a reimagining. Um, we did take this to Patreon, and I just wanted to shout out a couple, but I also am going to say them because I don't want to, some of them come with like some, there's some like light spoiler. So oh, I'm just going to okay. like, but, but some not, some not. Like one person just, I was like, I basically was like, where, what dramas have a second lead SOS that you feel like, you know, is, imp- that has impacted? God, sorry. <laughs> what dramas have uh, a second lead SOS that's impact? Like, what dramas need a second lead SOS, essentially? Right. And then if anyone has any ideas for one, like, I was like, you know, just give like a short, a short idea and put it down. So, I mean, like, there's a couple, like, we had one person who just wrote Castaway Diva. Which none uh, of us have seen yet. Right, but, right. you know, so there's been, like, a little bit of that. Well, like, I think there is some... I could be wrong. I feel like there, like a spoiler would even be saying who the second lead is, I feel like. I could be wrong. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't so, want to okay, get well, spoiled. So there's a couple that just have no spoilers attached. Okay. But while you were sleeping? Oh, um, yes. Yeah, somebody that's out- Jung Hae-in. I, I mean, that's not a, I mean, not a spoiler. But Jung Hae-in is the second male lead, and he is... I thought we're not sh- doing this yeah, second lead. Like you saying <laughs> who the second literally- lead is is the spoiler. You just said that that's a spoiler. No, for, I said that for Castaway Diva, not for the not for like most dramas. Oh, I took you to mean. Okay, no, that's not what I'm. But okay, so, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I, I don't know. Anyway, okay. another one is Welcome to Semdalri. Mm. Another one is Alchemy of Souls. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Alchemy of Souls really. Wait, we didn't give. We didn't do him? Alchemy of Souls, no. Which is wild to me. Why didn't we do that yet? That's on the list for next time. One of us has to do that. Okay. So I just want to do. Oh, and then we have one, which is My Lovely Liar. I'm. Yeah. Well, actually, why don't we talk about. Why don't we first just say the three of us so people know what's coming, who we, who we are writing SOS. Okay. In case you don't want to get spoiled about something. Yeah. In case yeah. you don't want to get spoiled. Okay, so, so oh, I am writing an SOS for E Gong Min, who is the second male lead from My Lovely Liar. I am doing something a little bit different. So I am just going to say I'm rewriting a side storyline from A Time Called You. Okay. I'm doing Kyung Une who is uh, a second female lead in My Dearest, played by Ida. And I'm purposely not naming characters right now because hugely spoilery for mine. So another area of people, so if you don't want to hear much about Duna, slip ahead for the next 30 seconds. Um, Go. Okay. <laughs> um, so a huge one from the Patreon was Jinju of Duna, which is no surprise. We love her. And we even talked about that in Slack. We're like, oh, we got to do one for her. So yeah, we need to do this again more often. We do. Yeah. And then um, the another perennial one that we get is um, True Beauty. Okay. Uh, which I agree, honestly, even though I like like the main person in that, I the second lead was great. So, okay, let's jump into ours, and who would like to go first? Should we rock, scissors, paper it? Is that how you say it? Rock, scissors, paper? What do you say? Is that the order you say it in? I say rock, paper, scissors. 
Yeah, what did you say? Rock, scissors, paper. Who says rock, I see rock, scissors, paper. It's rock, paper, scissors. Wait, no. Yeah, it is. It's, it's a rock, rock, paper, scissors. No, scissors rock, paper, paper. scissors, shoot. No, here I see. I just looked up. I just looked it up. What's rock, scissors, paper called? How do you play rock, scissor, paper? Rock, and then. And then people say, nope. nope. Dummy, no. it's rock, paper, <laughs> scissors. Rock, paper, scissors. I think it's got to be. That's got to be like a. We got to uh, ask someone else. A re- regional. Let's oh, see. Oh, my God. Rock, paper, scissors, UK versus, oh, Jesus. In the UK, they call it scissors, paper, stone. God, freaking That's very UK. Harry Potter sound. Yeah, that is <laughs> so UK. Um, I want to be able to learn the proper way that they say it in Korea. You know, like I want to know the, the, the proper pronunciation. We'll have to ask. Rock, this. paper, scissors. No. It Rock, even paper, comes scissors, off the shoot. mouth bad. Rock, scissor, paper. How can you even say that? I feel like you're tripping rock, over paper, your tongue. Rock, paper, scissor. No, rock, rock scissors, scissors, paper. paper. Rock, scissor, paper. You just zip it out. Whereas you're like, rock, paper, scissor. Rock, paper, scissor. You are well, a monster. Let's do rock, you are truly scissors. a monster. <laughs> let's do rock, okay. scissors, paper. Okay, no, I'm not playing your game. <laughs> This is this is your chance to try something new. This might set a trajectory for the rest of your life. You do oh like one little butterfly effect. Okay, ready? <laughs> Rock, Rock, paper, scissors, 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 go. Shoot. What's the shoot? Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. That's how, That's you, how you say it. it. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Shoot. No, this is Rock, shoot. scissor, paper, go. <laughs> she said go. Okay, I had scissors. I had, I had paper. rock. Okay, so okay. so paper Megan covered- wins because Megan can beat the scissors and the scissors cut the paper. And the paper covers rock. The paper yeah, but I've already cut the- you. <laughs> you can't do rock, paper, scissors with three people, okay? What is happening here? The world is disintegrating. You, <laughs> you didn't play this game fun. <laughs> I don't want to play with you anymore. (laughs) Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Okay, you know what? I'll go first. Okay. Okay, so I'm really glad Patreon mentioned Egong Min from My Lovely Liar because I loved him. Uh, And Amy and I watched this, just Amy and I. And while we were watching it, I said in Slack to Amy, right, I'm calling Egong Min (laughs) for second meal. A couple episodes in, you were like, I'm calling him. Yeah, I called. I was like, I'm calling him because. So, um, let me just say this about My Lovely Liar. I did really like it. I think Amy did, too. The romance, though, just sort of, like, fizzled for us. There was- I was ma- I met on this drama. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I, mean, I, I like the plot of the drama, but the romance really had no tension, kind of fizzled out. And um, I honestly was really into the second male lead. And it kind of, I think, like, affected my view of the romance a little bit, so. Uh, let me give a little background on how Egong Min fit into My Lovely Liar uh, to give a little bit of, you know, context for his character. So My Lovely Liar, by the way, came out last year in 2023. Mok Sol Hee, played by Kim So Hyun, can hear lies. When someone isn't telling the truth, she hears a flat tone in her ear. And she's had this ability as long as she can remember. So when the drama starts, she's the owner of a tarot card cafe, and she also works as a liar hunter, where people pay her to sort out who is lying to them. She's a bit cynical, and we do see in a flashback that she used to be very much in love with and engaged to police officer Lee Gong Min. I think at the time they were dating, he was like training to be a police a trainer, officer. Yeah, in- trainee, yeah. Yeah. And Lee Gong Min, who is our second male lead, was played by So Ji Hun. She never tells him about her her ability, even though they're like gonna get married. And but it's fine because he never lies to her. But when he does start lying about where he's been, uh, when they are, are apart, she is devastated. She thinks he's cheating on her, and she breaks up with him. 
So in the present, uh, she that you know this was several years ago. So in the present, she becomes involved with her neighbor, played by Min Hyun, which is who is also our favorite double sword wielding sad mage from Alchemy of Souls. What she doesn't know is that Min Hyun, uh, also known as Doha, was the prime suspect in the murder of his ex girlfriend. And although he was acquitted because of a good alibi, the suspicion has followed him so much that he's had to change his name and hides his face behind a mask. So Yi Gong Min moves precincts, and now he works near Sol He. When he sees her again, it's clear he's still in love with her. And that's when we learn the real reason he lied to Sol He all those years ago. He had stomach cancer. And he didn't want to burden her during his treatments. And when he finds out that she's been spending time with the infamous murder suspect, he sets out to make sure that Sol He is not Doha's next victim. He seems pretty convinced of Doha's guilt. And I really was kind because of, I really liked Gong Min at the time that this was like, I was really rooting for him not to like be the male lead, but I was really rooting for him just to have like a good storyline. And so I thought the drama was going to end up making Gong Min the bad guy, like intent on getting Doha behind bars, even if the evidence can't prove it, just because he wants Sol He for himself. But nope, the drama continued on, uh, you know, with the proper character, I think, of Gong Min, because he's a good guy through and through. He not only wants to protect Sol He, but he does want proper justice. In the end, he's instrumental in catching the right killer. And he is happy that Sol He and Doha get to live out their lives happily ever after, now free of suspicion. So, all that to say, Gong Min is a good dude. He's a cancer survivor, good cop, caring friend, and he is cute. So cute. I really liked his haircut. And as I said while watching Lovely Liar with Amy, I was like, I called him right away. Uh, as my second male lead, and so I was pretty excited about this. Um, and so here I am to give our mostly truth-telling cop his own happily ever after. Um, I just want to say I have a couple inspirations. My Lovely Liar itself, you know, there were there was like a murder mystery. There was, you know, some some good, yeah, some good mysteries. And I'm also currently, <laughs> I'm also currently watching A Shop for Killers on disney plus so like you know just go with where i'm going um and also would any of this probably actually happen in true crime absolutely not okay this is a k-drama so just you know suspend your disbelief <laughs> okay i was also kind of a little inspired by um oh my gosh if you wish upon me okay so here we go after watching his first love and her fiancé ride off into the sunset together, Gong Min throws himself into his work. One day, he participates in a raid on a drug dealer's house and chases after a woman who flees on foot. He finally tackles her, and she fights him with all she has. She's dirty, skinny, has stringy hair, has stringy hair, and she smells bad. He assumes she might be, have been there to buy drugs and pulls up her sleeves to see if she has track marks. He sees no marks on her skin before she yanks her sleeves down and tells him that, yes, she was there to buy drugs. She's high right now, and she was, you know, just, yeah, she was just there to buy some product. Except she isn't acting like she's high. Her eyes are clear, and there is something about her that is familiar. But why would she lie about committing a crime she didn't commit? When he takes her to the station, everything about her, everything out of her mouth feels like a lie to him. He thinks about calling his old girlfriend and asking her to come to come to the station to root out this woman's lies, but something about that makes Gongman feel like he's cheating. He wants to figure this woman out himself. In the end, he has to let her go because he, because he doesn't really have proof of a crime, but he's intent on keeping his eye on her. Ha Jong, yes, I named her after Singles Inferno. Ha Jong can't believe her luck. She left her hometown only to run into one of the cops who bungled her sister's murder investigation. Actually, bungled implied an effort. There was no effort, because the cops didn't care about a homeless drug addict found dead in an alley. But Ha Jong wants to find the cop culprit who took her intelligent sister, got her hooked on drugs, and then stabbed her. After her sister's death, Ha Jong had some plastic surgery done to change her appearance just a little bit. Just, just, just you know, a little nose job. Just a little nose job. <laughs> 
and then left her successful career as an interior designer. I have no idea why I said she's an interior designer. <laughs> I wrote I wrote this last night. Anyway, um, to follow. So, yeah, she left her career as. <laughs> I love you're cracking yourself up. I am cracking myself up. I had a lot of fun with this. I will tell you right now. I, I hadn't meant to write like a whole story. And then I did because I just got carried away. Okay, so she uh, left her career uh, to follow basically in her sister's footsteps in order to figure out who murdered her. And she's close. She's gotten a lot of drug dealers to trust her. But if they find out, she doesn't actually use the product she claims to use. And she's not who she says she is. She could wind up dead, too. And now that stupid cop, Yi Gong Min, seems to be everywhere. She can't understand it. He didn't do a damn thing to investigate her sister's death. But now he's interested suddenly in her. And if he finds out who she really is, he could mess up everything she's worked for for the last two years. Gong Min has his hands full. He has his normal police shifts. He's following Ha Jong around, and he's work still working on a case that he refuses to give up. A woman who was stabbed in an alley back in his hometown. He promised her dad that he'd find her killer, he, but that he'd find who killed her. And although the, her father passed away, Gong Min intends to fulfill the promise. He suspects that the woman Ha Jong or he suspects that the woman who was killed, Ha Jin, fell in love with the wrong man who then got her hooked on drugs and into camera work. This is where I totally pulled in, if you wish upon me, by the way, with <laughs> yes, the cam girl, cam girl stuff. Yeah, like the cam girl, like against their will. If you're a cam girl and it's like your job and your choice, like go for it. These are like non-consensual <laughs> cam, cam girls. So the, boor the boyfriend of Ha Jin died of an overdose before Ha Jin died, so he's not her murderer. Gong Min suspects it's one of the camera work managers, but he hasn't been able to prove it. So I'm going to call this guy a cam work manager. He's kind of like that guy in If You Wish Upon Me who like makes sure the cam girls are like on the computer doing their work. So one night, Gong Min is spying on the cam work manager in an old warehouse, and he runs into Ha Jong. But she doesn't look like, or he, he sees her, I'm sorry, from like across the warehouse. She doesn't look like she did last time he saw her. She's clean, fresh-faced, and he still has that familiar feeling. And also, she's spying, just like him. When she stumbles and makes a noise, the cam manager heads in her direction to, like, investigate what the noise is. And Gong Min knows that he, you know, she can't get caught. So he distracts the cam manager so that Ha Jong can escape. And then once he's able to get away, he goes after her and confronts her. He, he knows she's not the drug addict she had pretended to be. So who is she? She refuses to tell him and takes off. So he focuses on tailing her. And when she makes a trip to the columbarium, he follows her. And that's when he finds her in front of Ha Jin's ashes, calling her a knee. It's then he rec recognizes her as Ha Jin's shit sister. She looked a little different back then, but he knows now that's her. He's confused, though. Why doesn't she recognize him? And why wouldn't she ask for his help? Ha Jong can't seem to shake this cop. And what's worse is that he saved her from the cam manager, who she knows has violent tendencies. So now she feels indebted toward Gong Min. Why couldn't he have been a good cop for her sister? When she visits a known hangout of her sister's late boyfriend, she comes face to face with Gong Min again. And this time she's over it. She tells him to fuck off. Well, you know, it's a K-drama. So she's like, get out of here. Kaja. Well, that Kaja's let's go. Um, yeah, she, she tells him she's going to file stalker charges, but he cuts her off and tells her that he knows who she really is. So she's shocked and agrees to eat a meal with him at a restaurant reluctantly. They eat ramen and drink beer. And she's very cold to him. She because, you know, she blames him for bungling her sister's investigation. So she lets him know that she recognizes him, too, but she doesn't trust him because of his past incompetence after her sister's murder. And she really gives it to him. And he's racked with guilt. And he doesn't feel like he really has any right to her respect because he knows that things went wrong back then. So even though he's been working on the case, you know, his, his department didn't investigate it properly in the first place. So he accepts her anger because that's what he believes he deserves. And he also gets down on his knees and apologizes to her. But he tells her that he doesn't think he can stop following her. He's seen one sister die, and he won't see another. Ha Jong wants to remain angry at him. She spent much of her adult life blaming the police, but Gong Min's sincerity when he knelt and apologized to her reached her heart. She tosses and turns that night in bed. But the next day, 
she's back on her investigation. She finally tracks down another cam girl who worked with the sister, and the cam girl is confused about Ha Jong's questions. She said that a cop has visited her several times over the past few years asking about Ha Jin's life, and she's told him everything she knows. Ha Jong is surprised and wants to know who the cop is. The cam girl tells her he's a tall, handsome cop named Lee Gong Min. And Ha Jong can't believe it. In a day, she shows up at the police station where Gong Min is behind his desk. She confronts him and yells at him in front of everyone. And he ushers her outside while the rest of the station stares at them. So she says, have you really been investigating my sister's death? And that's when he tells her the truth, that he's never forgotten her sister and that he's been working on her case all these years. And then he made a promise to her late father. He pulls a necklace out of his shirt where a ring is attached. Ha Jong recognizes it. It's her sister's ring. Gong Min told her that her father gave it to him. Ha Jong asked why he didn't tell her the truth over ramen. And he said he didn't feel like he deserved praise. He still hasn't been able to find her sister's murderer. And she sm then he smiles and tells her that, you know, she smells much better now. And he appreciates her clean clothes. She rolls her eyes but feels herself smile. He asks if they can work together to pool their resources to find her sister's murderer. And although Ha Jong is used to working alone, she thinks she can make an exception. They begin to work the case together. And during late night stakeouts, they bond over shared interests while eating convenience store kimbap and iced Americanos. Ha Jong has taken judo lessons, and she te teaches Gong Min a few moves while he teaches her how to throw a proper punch. She knows she's starting to fall for Gong Min, but her life is a mess. She's dedicated her whole self to finding her sister's murderer. Murderer. Does she really have anything to offer Gong Min? As far as Gong Min, he has fallen for Ha Jong. She's fierce and loyal. Now that she's told him the truth, she, she doesn't lie at all. She tells him when he has a bad hair day and makes fun of his dirty police car with his fast food wrappers. But he knows their relationship can never develop until Ha Jong has some closure, and he's determined to get that for her. They aren't any closer to getting anything on the cam manager, so Ha Jong decides to pretend to be a girl that this man can prey on while she's wearing a wire. But of course she doesn't tell Gong Min, because this is a K-drama, and we have to do things in secret. And because he wouldn't allow it. But she has to do something. So she gets the cam manager alone in the back room of a club and while pretending to be drunk, asks him some questions about the work. She asks him if it's dangerous or if any of the girls had died and he admits there was one girl, but her death had nothing to do with camming. She asks what it had to do with and he says that the girl let him on and then refused to see him so he had to take care of her himself. But Ha Jong won't do that to him, would she? The confession is enough for Ha Jong and she excuses herself to go to the bathroom, but she trips on the way out and when he reaches for her, her shirt rips open and he sees the wire. He flies into a rage and he pulls out a knife. Ha Jong is horrified, wondering if that's the knife that killed her sister. She remembers Gong Min's advice and lands a solid punch on the cam manager's jaw. The knife clatters to the ground. They fight over it. And Ha Jong manages to gain control. She plunges the knife into the man's stomach. Meanwhile, Gong Min knew Ha Jong was up to something. He finally tracks her down to the club and to the back room. He hears a fight inside and rushes into the room. There, he finds Ha Jong holding a bloody knife while the cam manager screams on the floor. In the end, the cam manager survives the wound and confesses to his crimes thanks to Ha Jong's wire recording. And that was the same knife. I don't know. He confesses all this. Gong Min leads Ha Jong home, feeling guilty he wasn't there to save her. He thinks she's traumatized, but instead, She's pretty elated. She tells him this is the closure she needed, that she had to do this for her sister, but she couldn't have done it without Gong Min. As the tears finally start flowing, she said now she feels like she can move on with her life. And Gong Min asks if he can be part of her future, and she says, of course, we're life partners now. And that's the end. Yay! <laughs> I do have a question, though. Oh, I mean, probably. <laughs> I do have a question. I do. Have, I know. I know. I know you said this couldn't happen in real life, but what was she living on for two years? Uh, I don't just like odd jobs. <laughs> you know what? She was a delivery person. She did DoorDash. Okay. okay. She did DoorDash. I just want to make sure she had a job. No, what's funny is she as quit, I was, she quit her interior design job to go and do <laughs> live undercover, live undercover and pretend to do drugs. Um, I, as I was typing this up, I was like, wait, where is she living and how is she affording it? Like, I thought that to myself and I was like, ah, she's like a part-timer somewhere. She's a part-timer at Sunny's Chicken Okay. Shop. Okay. I just want to make sure she was like slinging chicken somewhere. Yeah. Anyway, I hope I, that was fun. It was very, it was very good mix of like 
my lovely liar and if you wish upon me wasn't yeah. it it kind of felt i that's those were my inspirations I'm I'm always very inspired by K dramas, and you know, so yeah, I drew a little bit. But anyway, I hope Gongmin's happy. He's got a feisty Ha Jong, who probably gives him that like look with her chin dip, just like in Singles Inferno. <laughs> All right, Amy, you want me to go? Or are you asking if I want to rock paper scissors for it? Yeah, I would love to rock scissor paper you. All right, because it's it's okay to be okay. <laughs> <laughs> fuck you ready rock, rock paper scissors scissors paper, go. shoot all right it's you. Uh, okay okay so i'm Amy, very excited you have not seen this no. is my dearest i'm going off my dearest which amy has not seen and i actually have no idea what you know or do not know so i'm just going to do some setup to 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 start us off i know nothing except for the end <laughs> <laughs> okay, so My Dearest is a South Korean historical drama that follows the romance of Lee Jang Hyun and U Gil Che. So Gil Che is a noblewoman who's living during the cha- the time of um the uh, Qing invasion, which is like the 1600s, and she is in love with a scholar named Yun Jun, who is her friend's fiance. But she meets a mysterious man called Lee Jang Hyun and falls for him during the same time. Lee Jang Hyun is a complex man with dark secrets that he's hiding. Love's not in his plans. He lacks sincerity. He's kind of like a guy, like he's, he's a little bit, I don't want to say slimy. He's just more kind of like, he's very, he relies on his charm a lot to get him through things. Um, but through meeting Gil Che and their relationship, he is transformed. This is a, for the first, there's two seasons, essentially. Season one is 10 out of 10. No notes. Megan and I both agree. One of the best dramas that we've ever seen. I do not say the same for season two. However, what is important to note in all of this going into it is that it's a Gone with the Wind retelling. If you know much about Gone with the Wind, it makes a lot more sense. If you don't, it makes less sense. But if you want me to just kind of like go through who are the... So, Amy, for you, do you know Gone with the Wind? Yes or no? Yeah. I mean, like it's been many, 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 many years. Okay. So essentially, for the leads, we have Gil Che as Scarlet, famous Scarlet O'Hara, and that... Or O'Hara, (laughs) O'Hara. And then uh, Lee Jang Hyun plays uh, Rhett Butler. So... I am going to do the second lead, who is Un A, who is Melody in Gone with the Wind. And she is married to Yun Jun, who would be like the character of Ashley. So, how does Un A serve as the Melanie quote unquote character in this retelling? Let me just do a very quick refresher on what Melanie kind of like the role Melanie played in Gone with the Wind, because it kind of sums up the role that. In many ways, Une was uh, set up to uh, to kind of like be. So Melanie serves as a foil to everything Scarlet's not. She's kind instead of cutting. She's quiet instead of bold. She's thoughtful instead of instead of self centered. Um, she be- she thinks the best of everyone. And what's interesting is that in many ways during um, Gone with the Wind, Scarlet and others consider her to be like very naive and foolish, but there's something within her kindness that lets her see kindness in other people. And so in Gone with the Wind, like she will recognize and be kind to local prostitutes and that will like serve them later when like they, like the prostitutes will come to their aid or she'll see kindness in Rhett Butler that other people have missed. So she's she's kind, but she also like believes in people's goodness. So in my dearest, here's why we have because in some ways Une is left with an off ramp and a relationship, <laughs> and it's really problematic. So in my dearest, Une ascent she lives. She makes it to the end of this woman killing drama. And she is essentially rewarded, and I put that in quotes, by getting back the dustiest dude to ever dust. <laughs> so He's my girl worst. survived war. <laughs> the, worst. the worst. She survived war, captivity, assault, starvation, 
survival only to discover her ick husband, who she's estranged from, mid-attempted in taking his life. Like, they've been estranged for a minute, and she finally, like, goes by his house one day as he's, like, dangling from a noose. And still alive. So they, like, cut him down, and he's alive. So what happens is when she cuts him down, he weeps, and there's a reconciliation. Now, why would there be an estrangement? The estrangement has occurred because during some of the barbarian invasions, when Une was running for her fucking goddamn life, a barbarian touched her shoulder. Touched her bare shoulder. That's it. Because she was saved. Yeah. But that's it. That's he wanted. He, he wanted to. He wanted to assault her. Yeah. He wanted to assault her. Gr- he well, did not get further than touching think, her shoulder. I actually before. don't think he kind of like pulled down her top. He did. He, he did. T- he. He touched her bare wrist. Yeah, he stuff. he was able to t- put... Uh, sure. <laughs> Ludicrous, but whatever. Her husband, when he finds out about it, comes from the philosophy that other men did at the time, which was better to go to the cliff, throw your dress over your head, and jump off the cliff, mm-hmm. and, uh, and uh, preserve your honor. And that will give the honor to the men because basically their wife who's been defiled is dead and the honor can continue. So he's like, so oh, yeah. I they did not jump off. Yeah, he yeah, he, he was basically I'm like, sorry, please do jump your... off the cliff. She does not. <laughs> I'm sorry. This yeah, is no, your go thing. Go for it. Jump in. But I'm just saying I feel so strongly about how awful this dude is. So I'm sorry. I'm going to stop now. But he's just like, he's always been, so he's not awful the whole time. It's not like he's presented to be this monster. He's presented to be like this very big intellectual who's very influenced by Confucian ideals. And he um, he believes that there's a proper way to do things. And the proper way it turns out for his wife, when she finally pushes him, like, was like, did you think I should die? He was basically like, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah basically. Yeah. And so they had an estrangement until she found him mid attempt of his life and cut him down he shed some tears and then like that's the last you see of them like she's with this guy crying and the hero goes off to like finish her story she looks so over you're basically like, yay she gets that fuck it yeah she looks over <laughs> yeah, like you're like she gets this dude she's like oh and we're like bye have fun with your marriage <laughs> and she is unmoved by his tears by the end okay so, she deserves better. So, I have written a, a draw. So, basically, yeah. Like, I like this character. I'm not going to stand for her getting this man as her happily ever after. Like Megan said, she deserves better. So, I came up with a drama called For All Time. So, Kyung One is back with her husband, Yeon Joon. Every day is the same. This former noblewoman cooks, cleans, and runs a variety of scrappy businesses from selling eggs to washing clothes for people in town to keep them financially afloat. Yunjun reads books, looks out the window, and cries. Yunjun isn't centering her pain and trauma. No, no, no. He is full of self-pity and he wants constant reassurance from Une that she forgive him for encouraging her to choose an honorable death after a barbarian touched her shoulder once during an invasion. Une is weary, and she's over the relationship. Yunjun senses her disinterest, so hatches a brilliant idea. He wants to get her pregnant. He's decided that what she needs to be happy is having children, preferably six or seven. That way she'll be so busy and contented by fulfilling her ultimate role as a woman that she won't have any time to ponder if he sucks. He delivers this good news to Une without bothering to check in whether she wants to do this or not. The spoiler is she does not. So rather than skipping to his bed to perform her marital duty, she takes a plodding full moon stroll up to the cliffs above the river with a bottle of rice wine. Look, she isn't going to jump to her death to make a man feel better. And any man who ever thought that was a good idea isn't worth her time. She cries heartbroken because once she did love her husband and now feels like a fool. She's trapped and doesn't know how to escape. The earth trembles beneath her feet. What she didn't realize is that while she sat drinking and weeping, the moon went into an eclipse and turns an ominous red. The earthquake triggers a landslide 
and she tumbles into the river far below, the current pulling her under until she's about to lose consciousness. A hand reaches down and she grabs it, getting yanked to the shore, gasping. It's a woman, Kim Soo Jin, and it's no longer the 1600s. It's the dawn of the 20th century. Joseon has fallen and Japan has annexed the country. Une has traveled through time to a disorienting new world, and so are her feelings for her rescuer, a sullen, tattooed, reticent woman who lives in a forest hideout with far too many guns. Sujin has three secrets. One, in this time period, she is an assassin, killing corrupt, occupying soldiers who harass women and children. Two, she's actually a time traveler. She moves between years and also worlds, never putting down roots. Third, she's attracted to both women and men, which causes issues depending on where she emerges and who touches her heart. At this point, she has resigned herself to a life alone where she needs no one and relies only on herself, her sense of justice, and the potted jade plant that was once a gift from her mother. Une knows nothing about guns or war, but she can make a house a home, even if it's an outlaw's shanty. Soon, Une settles into an odd pattern where Sujin leaves for the night to deliver justice. And Une embroiders sheets, tends to chicken, mends torn clothing, and makes delicious food. Sujin may not say much in the way of gratitude, but she begins to gruffly give small trinkets to Une. A flower she picked in the woods, a sweet from the market, a hairpin. One night, Sujin comes home more pale than usual. She yells at Une and asks why does she do all these things? She didn't travel through time just to keep someone's house. What does she want? Une is shaken, but what she wants, she doesn't know if she can say. She wants to be with Sujin forever, always by her side, but she doesn't know how to speak those words. They feel too big. As she stammers, Sujin shakes her and out of frustration kisses her. The kiss grows less angry and more passionate. One was never kissed like this by her dusty scholar husband. And then Sujin goes limp, fainting in Une's arms. Une realizes that she's been shot and has been bleeding out through a badly wrapped bandage. Une tends to Sujin's wound and she survives the night. But Sujin has a fever and she can't bring it down. Weekly, Sujin tells her that the next night, in this world, there will be an eclipse. Une needs to bring her to the river so they can leave this time and get help. Une complies, and while bringing Sujin to the river encounters a bandit. Une doesn't hesitate to use Sujin's pistol and realizes she's a natural shot. The man collapses and Sujin grabs Une's hand as they tumbled into the river only to emerge in modern Seoul. Here, Sujin has an apartment with uh, has an apartment in Hanam with piles of money stashed away. She can also use a strange device that can talk to people. A friend arrives who's a doctor and has antibiotics. The friend praises Une for her medical treatment and says she probably saved Sujin's life. Une learns that Sujin has safe houses in different times and worlds and has been on a single mission to find her mother who was taken by a gumio when Sujin was a girl. All that was left of the mother was the jade plant that Sujin treasures. She doesn't know where the spirit is hiding her mother. She hunts clues and sometimes she gets close. Her fear is that the Gumio is her father, which is why she has the magical powers of travel, slow aging, and a sixth sense that can detect hints to his presence even as he evades her. But this is not Une's fight. Une deserves a simple life with her simple skills making a simple man happy. Une bristles. Sujin doesn't get to tell Une what she wants or gets to have. She's done with that life. She's ready to step into her power and stand by Sujin's side. Sujin tries to make her leave, but Une isn't afraid anymore. She knows what she wants, Sujin, and she'll want her in any time for all time, and she'll help her find her mother. Dun, dun, dun. I love it, the time travel. Fantastic. Ugh, amazing. I was muted so that you could, like, say it, but I did scream, like, out loud when uh, the time travel. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, I just love you continuing to call the husband Dusty. Is it bad that I wanted the bandit to be him and that she shoots him and kills him? He's awful. He is so awful. Like, I'm sorry. I disliked him. I actually disliked him the entire drama. So I never liked him. I mean, he yeah, wasn't the whole a time monster until no, the end. He's not. No. But he's that not. was a fantastic SOS. I don't even know the drama and I don't care. That was That was so much fun to listen to. That was great. All right. Well, that was my first uh, girl love drama. Let's see some more of those happen. I love it. I love it. I would watch that. And you're just like deep in the time travel mindset right now. <laughs> yes, I'm very much. I'm writing a time travel. So 
And also, because you haven't seen Moon Lovers, there was a nod to Moon Lovers because Moon Lovers has the eclipse will happen and it goes red. Uh, and so that was like, that was a little shout out to Moon Lovers. Okay. Yeah, we didn't get that. Yeah. <laughs> well, before Amy uh, does her SOS, um, I think it's time for our favorite segment of the week. It's our K-pop wreck of the week. So uh, what do we have this week? Well, we are going to do a, a quick convo on Love Wins All, which is a song by IU, who, you know, I think we all love IU on this pod. She's mm-hmm. amazing. And uh, this song is it, the song is good. It's a big ballad. It has a music video that also features V or Kim Taehyung from BTS. And we've all seen it. We are actually going to do a like a snack deep dive on it with uh, the podcast Afternoon Army, our BTS spinoff podcast. So check that out in, you know, probably another week or another week or so. But for everyone here, this is an amazing, I mean, honestly, I feel like this music video gripped me in a way that most TV content hasn't gripped me yeah. in a long time. In five, uh, yeah. five minutes, I went through every emotion. Mm-hmm. And, and I'll like, be honest, usually. So you, oh, go ahead. No, I was just gonna. I was just gonna say, like, usually, like, usually when you guys like post, you know, like K-pop stuff, like in um in our Slack stuff, I'll watch the video and it's enjoyable and that's great and good song, yay, we're done. Mm-hmm. So Leah, Leah didn't even post a link. She made us go look for it. <laughs> Leah yeah, pops anyway. into Slack. She's like, she's like, you need to go listen to this song watch the video with v like with v it's you know it's basically it's a, it's a movie and a video and i'm like all right i gotta go look it's 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 v um and i was crying at the end of the five minutes like it's a whole i've movie. never been moved by a music video like that before ever well I admit, I, you all you posted was, oh, you have to go watch the music video from IU featuring V. And I was like, you're like, it's amazing. And I was like, of course you think it's amazing. Like, not to be, der- like, I, I'm not trying to patronize you, but I was like, yeah. of course you freaking love it because V's in it. But I was like, all right, like, I'll go watch it. And I was like, I am sorry for, like, like at all questioning you because it was in incredible i've only really been able to watch it once because it really honestly stirred so many emotions in me it was beautiful it was emotional uh it was acted incredibly in the short time period i mean i got a whole movie in this short time period it's just it's art it's truly art it's amazing it's so cool so thank you for sharing and making me watch it and i think it's a testament Oh, yeah. No worries. So I purposely did not put the link in because I figured it would make it more compelling if I didn't. I was like, I had the link to drop in. You did that on like, purpose? I, and I'm like, I'm you not dropping sneak. it because I feel like it'll be more tantalizing if I just say it. And, either, and then if you don't, that's fine. But like, I was like, I'm not going to do it because then I, you'll just be like, I'll get to it later. And so I was like, I want to make it more, more curious. But IU and V are, look, they, they both are actors. I use been in many more dramas. V's been in just one. Um, but they're also very famous idols in their own right and famous celebrities. And I think that like, I knew they were both talented, but it takes a really special talent to disappear in a role. That's a music video. Like we don't have like oh. a movie for them to disappear in. Yeah. No words. They see no themselves in many ways to me. Yeah. No words, no dialogue. They were their own people in this. I felt like I understood the characters and I felt like I was watching two people in a post-apocalyptic world that I just, within 30 seconds, I forgot I was watching these two famous people and I was just invested in the story. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. It was amazing. I loved it. I loved it. The song is beautiful. And I I don't want to give too much away because if, yeah, if you want to unpack it, like come to the podcast, the song is beautiful. But the music video, I'm going to say it's the most powerful music video I've ever seen in my entire life. I love it. Yeah. I absolutely loved it. So, yeah. So, it's called, what, Love Wins All? Because I... Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Keep going. Love Wins All. Which... Oh, no. I Love Wins All. Just be prepared. That it's going it to... <laughs> it it's probably going to hit you hard. So, just be prepared for yep. that. Mm-hmm. 
Like there's nothing horrible that happens on screen. Like you're not going to be like, it's not like violence and, no. you know, it's just very it's powerful and you powerful, feeling, heartbreaking, beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. All the things. Yeah. Does love win all at the end? I don't know. A question for a different time. <laughs> if you enjoy our podcast, you have our patrons to thank, at least in part. Afternoon of Delight Patreon allows us to keep creating content for y'all to enjoy. Thank you so much to everyone who is supporting us there. And not to brag, but our Patreon community is pretty awesome. And you can join at a tier that feels good to you. Gain access to fun perks like K-drama posts, monthly Patreon-only bonus podcasts, and even a live K-drama support group on Zoom. Because we know firsthand what it's like to have no one to talk to about those crazy plot twists, amazing characters, and all those feelings. And look, no one should have to walk that walk alone. So learn more by visiting afternoonadelight.com. That's www.afternoonadelight.com. And hey, while you're on the website, you can check out Afternoon A Delight podcast merch, find links to book recommendations, bop along to our K-pop recs, blow up your skin with K-merch recs, find all of our social media and a link to our email so you can send us recommendations or feedback. And hey, while you're at it, why don't you pop over to Spotify or Apple Podcasts and leave us a five-star review? It really helps with our discoverability. Gamsamnida. All right, go well, watch. let's go get listen. into Amy's. Yeah. Non-traditional yet awesome. We hope. Second lead SOS. So, yes. So let me just say, I my SOS is from A Time Called You. And if you listened to mine and Megan's pod on A Time Called You, Um, you know that there's a lot that goes into this drama and that any little tiny thing is a spoiler. So if you did not listen to our pod, if you have not watched this drama and you think you might want to watch it, I'm spoiling a huge part of the drama, not just with talking about these two side characters, but getting into these two side characters, I spoil something about the main characters as well. So I'm just warning you, um, if you don't want this drama spoiled for you, it's one of my favorite dramas that I have watched. Um, in, in all of my drama watching, it's, it's up there in my top 10. So yeah. So I advise you to go watch it. I wish you would go watch it. I want you to feel all the feelings that I felt watching it, but if you want to keep listening and you haven't watched it yet, you have been warned many, many times. Okay. Okay. So, um, yes, this is my, a time called you SOS. And, um, the title of it is the boys who lived. So this is a an alternate telling rather than uh just a second lead SOS because I'd call both of the, both of these are side characters. So this is An Hyo Sup, not as Nam Shi Hyun, but as Koo Yeon Joon, and our cameo from Rowoon as his friend Teha. So a little bit of background on um on all of this before i get to my little write-up so How are you even gonna start it i, I, I know i want to hear how you're gonna <laughs> it's gonna be funny it's gonna be funny because okay. not only am i not only am i giving away stuff about characters i'm giving away a huge conceit for the drama which is that it's not just a time travel drama but it's also a, a it's not even a body swap it's a body inhabitation yeah. um okay so Let's just start by saying that I loved A Time Called You, and I in no way want to change the happily for now that our principal characters get. So let's just say that what I'm proposing takes place with somehow, like by somehow not changing the outcome of the original drama, even though logically this could never work within the time travel rules of the drama. Okay. Like I'm not here to do a physics assignment. So just suspend your disbelief, okay? Megan's character didn't have a job, and she lived for two years that way. This can happen in in an alternate timeline or whatever. Yeah, DoorDad. Okay. So first, um, here's a really um, good synopsis of, like, the Yeonjun and Taeha, like, their short-lived relationship. Um, In some of this, I sort of gleaned from um, from Review Geek, uh, because they had a good sort of short synopsis of it and then I finessed it a little bit. So so both Yeon Jun and Taeha study at the same tutoring school for their CSATs, which are the college entrance 
college entrance exams. We can tell that Yeonjun is anxious at the top of the scene, waiting for someone to arrive, and in walks oh, floppy-haired Rowoon in a non-paid walk-on cameo that he just did for his friend, Anyosa. So Yeonjun can barely look at Teha without blushing. He's definitely shy about his feelings. Teha, much bolder, says that he drives three hours to be with Yeonjun and asks him if he knows why. It looks like he wants to say more, but gives up on seeing how clueless Yeonjun is. On a trip to Busan, Teha takes his mom's car, but Yeonjun is nervous as he is a novice driver. They keep bickering in like a friendly, flirty way, from messing with the glove box to looking at the map. Teha accidentally touches Yeonjun's hand and they lock eyes. They hold hands and smile, but at that moment, their car crashes into a truck. From here, Teha dies, and Yeonjun goes into a coma only to awake with she- with Shihyun in his body. <laughs> and then when Shihyun, as Yeonjun, dies in the plane crash, Shihyun goes back to his original body, and Yeonjun is all the way unalived. We have just buried the gays. Sigh. Bur- bur- we, that it- we buried them completely. Yeah. So that is their short-lived romance in the drama. And I wanted to give them a different ending. Thank um, you. Because, yeah, they, they deserved it. So, but first, before I do that, I want to read, um, this is like a short snippet from an article, um, on filmfare.com, um, that talks about like, uh, co- like Korean viewers, like, reaction to Rowan's cameo. So it says the appearance of Rowan in the drama was a delightful surprise, but it was even more commendable to witness two popular actors embrace the BL storyline with ease, especially in conservative South Korea. While many mainstream dramas are slowly changing their perspective on love and romance, they still lag behind other countries. However, when they do incorporate a BL or or GL storyline, they execute it well. Fans of the drama have been trending Roan and Anyo Sup on social media for the past 24 hours. This is when it aired, expressing their happiness that a mainstream drama has taken this bold step. This is all just to say that I appreciate and understand that we are looking at a culture that has much more conservative views than our own. But might I suggest a slightly bolder step of just letting the gay couple live <laughs> and make I'm sorry to laugh. I'm sorry. I know, but like, I know. Let just live? maybe letting them live and have <laughs> a fantastic first date. Have a fantastic first date. So that's really, that's as far as I went because I, I did not write a whole drama here. But I just wanted to give them their start because their ending came too soon. Okay. So here we go with the alternate storyline for Yeonjun and Teha that somehow does not affect <laughs> Our our main leads uh, storylines. Okay. Yeonjun and Teha drive along the highway toward Busan. Yeonjun is nervous, not only because Teha is a new driver, but because he likes his friend, like likes him, likes him. And he's been too preoccupied with his own realization of his feelings that he hasn't been able to discern if Tae feels the same way. Yeonjun teases Tae about his driving. You drive like my Helmoni. Tay, usually so brash and bold, responds with, Aish, you want me to speed while transporting such precious cargo? What if I crash into a white truck? They share a laugh and then fall into a weighted silence. Yeonjun wants to flirt, but he's not sure how. What if he flirts with his friend and loses him? Teha, as a friend, is better than no Teha at all, right? So when Tay mumbles something at the GPS, Yeonjun uses it, uses it as an in. Are we lost, Helmoni? he asks. He's gifted with another Aish, but Tay is smiling. He lets go of the wheel and he lets go of the wheel with his right hand and backhands Yeonjun on the shoulder. When his hand falls, it doesn't go back to the wheel, but instead onto Yeonjun's hand that is resting on Yeonjun's own thigh. Yeonjun sucks in a sharp breath, but he also has no words. Just then, the truck in front of them swerves into their lane. But even one-handed Tay is able to honk and avoid a collision, calling out a string of expletives at the careless truck driver as they pass. Do you still think I drive like a Helmoni? Teha asks, squeezing Yeonjun's hand. Ani, 
Yanjun replies. Do you know why I drive from Busan for our tutoring sessions? Tay asks with another squeeze. They, Yanjun replies, his cheeks warm and a goofy smile on his face. Open the glove box and get us a treat, Tay tells him, and Yanjun opens the compartment to find it loaded with sleeves and sleeves of copy co. I have I have a, a prop tonight. Um somehow with one hand he pops a coffee flavored square out of the foil for each of them, popping one into his own mouth and the other into Tay's, his finger brushing his companion's soft lips. They drive the rest of the way like that, hand in hand in a comfortable, delicious silence, save for the few occasions when Teha needs both hands on the wheel. Yanjun must fall must fall asleep because suddenly he hears Teha say, We're here, the special place I wanted to bring you. Yanjun opens his eyes to find Teha leaning over the center console, their fingers still entwined. They are in Busan at Songdo Beach. Teha asks Yanjun if he's afraid of heights, and Yanjun tells him no because it was not actually him in that other timeline that crashed to a fiery death in an airplane. They line up to board a cable car for Songdo's sky cruise across the ocean. Yunjun has heard of this cruise, but he's never been. He knows they will be crowded into a metal box with at least five or six other people, which dampens his spirits. Maybe Teha doesn't want anything more than to secretly hold hands in a car, but how will Yunjun ever know? When it's their turn to board, Teha whispers something into the ticket attendant's ear, and then he and Yunjun board their cable car. Yunjun is shocked when the attendant closes the cable car door with only Yunjun and Teha inside. Gamawayo Hyung Te calls with an ear with an ear to ear grin. Was that your brother? Yanjun asks, surprised. Yes, Te exclaims. We have a middle brother too, but we have a middle brother too between us, but I am Hyung's favorite. I told him I wanted to take my first love on a sky cruise so I could confess. They jerk forward and Teha falls against the window while a still stunned Yanjun falls against Teha. He is tall, and his chest is firm and warm. Yanjun can feel Tae's heart rapidly beating against his own chest, the only indication that Teha might even be a fraction of a bit as nervous as Yanjun is. Yanjun clears his throat. Miane, he says, then moves to straighten, but Teha grabs him somehow firmly and also gently by the cheeks. Did you hear what I said, he asks Yanjun, about my first love. Yanjun can barely breathe. Not with Tay's skin on his, a struck match lighting a fuse. They, Yanjun whispers. Do you know who my first love is, Teha adds. They, Yanjun says again. Should I kiss my first love, Tay teases. Would my first love like that? They, Yanjun grinds out through labored breath and gritted teeth. Yepuda, Teha whispers back, staring at Yanjun's lips, and then they kiss. No one's eyes are open. No one is dumbfounded about what is happening. Teha's lips are pillow soft yet insistent. He tastes like coffee and sunshine, and Yanjun finally understands who he is and what happiness feels like. Both of them know that the cable car ride is only 20 minutes long, and they aren't wasting a second of it. They have a full lifetime, one where they get to live to old age together with no untimely truck crashes to figure the rest out. And possibly another 20 minutes, because of course, Teha bought a round trip ticket after all. <laughs> I love it. I love it so much. That was so sweet and romantic. And it made me all the truck references. It was. I was like, thanks. Yeah. I think I got And I love that there was no open eye kiss. No, no fish eyed open eye kiss. Yeah. No, no, Thank no, no. You. This was the real deal. They both wanted it and they both wanted to keep at it in their private little cable car over the ocean for as long as they could. That sounds so fun. I love it. I love it. Oh, thank you. I hated them dying so much. Oh my god, so bad. And I, I like, so I was out of my mind. Like, I, I keep messaging Megan about this, about this drama. Like, Megan, Megan here, and also BTS Megan because she's watching as well. So I'm talking to both my Megans about this, and I'm like, mm. I have one quibble with this drama, and I can't say it until you get to this part because it's a huge spoiler. I'm like. But this drama would be like almost perfect if this stupid, stupid thing didn't happen. Yeah, and as and, soon as and it maybe happened, the and maybe the whole plane full of maybe the whole plane full of people that have to die for right. That was yeah. my quibble, but this was my quibble too. But as soon as it happened, I was like, "This is Amy's quibble." I knew it. I knew it because I just yeah. yeah, I knew it. 
yeah, my I had so I <laughs> my quibble was the whole plane of people dying and no one <laughs> gave them a heads up. And then this was my second quibble. <laughs> but I mean, so. and and again, like I, I I will say that I get it that we are watching we are watching stories that are made in a in a culture that is more conservative than our, than ours, and they're not going to be able to do as progressive of things as we want them to do, even if they want to do them. Like, I do believe that Anya Sup and Rowoon were like very happy about being able to do a short little like boy love, you know, type of thing. And that a lot of people were like, yes, progressiveness, but like, do they have to die? And I say no. <laughs> Look, no, it was they not, definitely did not have to die. It was not long ago that American TV, well, to be honest, they're still doing it. But I remember when the, I remember it was a really big deal. Did you guys ever watch The Hundred? I didn't watch it, but I remember they, they killed someone on The Hundred. And that's when like a million articles kept coming out about we need to stop burning the gates, like stop it. So that it's not that long ago. Like, you know what I mean? And we're, yeah, we're I know, actually still I know, like, it. Everybody moving in there, you know, we're, we're, we're nudging the needle every, every way that we can. So I'm just nudging right. it a little bit further. Uh -huh. But yeah, so that well, was I fun. Loved it. Yeah. I love, I do love doing these episodes. Like I said, it's more prep work for us because we're writers. So I think once we sit down and start writing, then we kind of like keep going, you know, and. Um, it's also so like conceiving of a whole new story, you know, like that's. Yeah. That's a it's big a brain list, power, you know, but it's fun. I enjoy doing these. I really want to do a rewrite and ending soon. So just FYI, guys, I want to start thinking because I have, mm -hmm. um, I have one I want to do really, really bad. So I feel like that could because we've only done one of those where we rewrote the ending, just because obviously it's a huge spoiler. Have we really like, only done it once? I think we, I think we did because you, uh, you did King. Eternal yeah. Monarch. What did I do? I don't remember what I did. I don't remember what I did. But I think but we I have almost a lot of podcasts. We do. I know. That's why if you look back through It's been three years, you guys. This is like this is like happy three year anniversary. I think January twentieth was our first one last year. I mean like I our first was. one in twenty Yeah, you're right. Twenty one. You're right. Maybe we should do one where we like listen to our first. I wish we could like listen no. to it and do like maybe no. that should be our snap. No. For do like a no, mystery I science don't. theater kind of like commentary. Well, all I remember, I don't. I, what I remember because I have a very clear memory of the first ten minutes is that I didn't speak because I remember being like, "No, the like podcast is be great. We all should do it." And then I remember like it started and I was like, "I don't know what to do." I don't remember you being. No, you like, talked. You were like very. Right. No, you were very good because I didn't talk about it. I wasn't gonna, like belabor it, and so I just remember sitting there. And if you go back and listen to it, I, I mean, I, what I have in my memory, I'm curious if it holds up. Is that I do not talk for some time. I remember you being very good. Yeah, Amy, and I was, was like, thank God, Amy's a teacher. Yeah, Amy was the the only one who was like naturally good at this. I don't think so. I, I mean, think thank so. you. But and like, I struggled. It would, it would, I, I feel like it would, that would be like reading my first book, like painful. I, I'm, I'm I really sorry, guys. It, I, I, so yesterday I had to can do it. <laughs> I don't think I could do it. Listen to that. Me we all have our knees. things. You, you can't handle listening to it. We can't ever handle listening to the, uh, the podcast that will no, never be no, aired. No, 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 no. That was the, the Korean drama snack podcast, mm -hmm. which we're not going to get into the details. Everyone, folks who've been around know long enough that we decided to do a drama that was like pretty early into the game. Like it was during the first six months where we were going to try snacks online and talk about them. And we bought soju and the soju went down real easy. I, and it was a no, disaster. I mean, you guys. I mean, I was loaded. I was loaded too. I just wasn't, I didn't get sick like you did. I mean, I can't believe I'm still alive. <laughs> like, I couldn't understand, but you were slurring your words so bad by the end. I, I, had, I, I didn't never, know what you were I, saying. <laughs> I never, ever, ever want to hear that. I don't want, I want to delete it. Like, I don't want that ever to like. I, I don't even know where we have. <laughs> oh my God. It must live with the video too. It'd be on Squadcast. It would be, yeah. 
I here here's the funniest thing. Like I think I told you guys this. Like when I woke up the next morning, Squadcast was still on. That's insane. Like, it wasn't recording. It oh, wasn't that would have been amazing. That no, it wasn't been recording. Amazing. But like I never left the session. Like it recorded your like puking in the bath. It would have been even more funny if you were just walking by like, oh, God. Guys, I can't. <laughs> I like, want to die. I still I still call bullshit. I call bullshit at K-dramas who have people sitting with like seven bottles of soju on the table. Right. right. And like just that, just themselves. Like, no, right. no, no. Like, Never again. I got, I definitely got loaded. I did not get what happened to you. I remember I just drank the two bottles so fast. And then I just remember I knocked over a whole bar- bowl of strawberries upstairs. I came upstairs like, ah, mom is. <laughs> it was like, I just remember like flipping a bowl of strawberries. And then I was like, I should probably go lay down for a little bit. <laughs> this is the worst. Oh, oh great. All right. Anyway. Uh, but it, it, yeah, I am. I think that's going to be, I'll report back. I'll report back. This week I will listen to our first podcast. Just to give you my hot take on it, because I'm curious. I I will try, but I feel like it's going to be so cringy. People are like, I just listen to it. (laughs) That's fine. Oh. Because, like, yeah, but listening to yourself. I mean, we've just told, like, a million people to go listen to. Well, not a million. I mean, it would be nice if it was a million. Yeah. Three million people now are going to We pronounce things wrong. I mean, I just can't. Oh, that oh. that's that's what's going to be cringy to me is the way the way that we say because we still pronounce things wrong. Yeah, I was going to say it's not like we we, we do. do try and we've gotten better. We are definitely not perfect. Those of you who help continue to correct us are gracious and patient. It was mm-hmm. worse, much worse. And it's a process. It is a process. That's all I can say. It, it's a process. Okay, well, let us know what you think about our SOS. <laughs> let us know. Yes. Thanks for listening. Go, let us know go if you watch think the rock, video. Pa- rock, paper, scissors oh or rock, yes. scissors, paper? Yeah, let us know. That's and about whatever the shoot there, is. There's going to be people who probably say like paper, scissors, rock. Oh my paper, God, monsters. Rock. I know, I've, but I feel like I've heard people say that before, but it, it's rock, paper, paper, scissors is the only rock, correct paper, way scissors. to do it. So Paper, rock, scissors. Paper, rock, scissors. I, now I forget what I even say. Rock, scissors, paper. That's it. No, rock, so paper, weird. scissors. Rock, paper, scissors. It's okay to not be okay. <laughs> None What's of the other okay. version? It's it's okay to it's not okay be okay. It's okay not to be okay. Because you don't want to split the infinitive. <laughs> or it's okay to not be okay. To not be. Right. The, the, the be grammatic, splitting the, the grammatically correct way to say it in English would be mm-hmm. it's okay not to not. be okay because you're not splitting the infinitive. I don't even know what an infinitive is. I don't either. Two I just know you can't a, split them. <laughs> two plus a verb is an infinitive. <laughs> All right. We got to go. I hate grammar. I hate I grammar know. so much. Okay. <laughs> the worst. All right. Thanks All right. for listening, everyone. Until next time. Anya. Anya. Kamsamnida. Thank you for listening to Afternoon of Delight. Where can you find us outside the pod? Head on over to AfternoonOfDelight.com. That's A-F-T-E-R-N-O-O-N-A-D-E-L-I-G-H-T dot com. You'll find links to all our social media, our book recs, K-pop and K-skincare recs, and if you want even more Afternoon of Delight, because really who doesn't, you can join our Patreon, where you can choose the patron level that's right for you. Join in daily K-drama conversations, listen to bonus podcast episodes just for patrons, and participate in our monthly live K-drama support group via Zoom. We can't wait for you to be a part of the community. Until next time, annyeong!